Hello everyone and welcome to this uh, quick video uh, summarising uh, the, the findings from Project Sync. I'm Matt Watson from the innovation team at Western Power Distribution and I'm going to try and spend a few minutes today trying to give you a quick overview on what we did in the project. Um, for those who are interested in finding out a bit more detail um, then there's a whole load of reports on the website to um, allow you to kind of delve in and, and find the exact ins and outs of what we did. So I thought I'd start by um, saying who Western Power Distribution are. So we are the largest of the distribution network operators in the UK. We cover four of the 14 distribution li distribution licenses and that means we cover um, about 7.8 million customers. In terms of the network we serve, we cover the 132KV network down to the LV network. So that means we take power from the transmission uh, system from National Grid and distribute that through across the country down to uh, customers stopping at the cutout. And that's a really interesting uh, uh, network that we're operating that is changing quite a lot um, through the through the advent of uh, distributed generation and renewable uh, uh, technologies. I thought I'd also give a bit of context around where SYNC sits within the wider innovation portfolio at WPD. Um, so we are a company that doesn't uh, prize ourselves in the amount of innovation that we uh, do. Um, and this is generally focused around sort of three key areas of assets, customers and operations. And Project SYNC normally sits within operations but also arches across to customers. Uh, working on how how we can use demand side response to help us manage our network more efficiently. In terms of context, um, there's an awful lot of detail that can be said about this, but I thought I'd stick to the high level. Um, that everyone's aware that there are quite um, stringent targets that the UK is looking to achieve, um, and one of the pillars around that is the sort of decarbonisation of um, power generation, heat and then transport, transport. And as such we've had a huge change in the way the energy system works. We've seen a large amount of renewables looking for connections um, and incentivised through various different mechanisms and instead of looking to connect um, to the transmission network as, as the system um, as was done traditionally, we've seen a sort of distribution of this generation as we've, as we've seen it connect to the distribution network. And to put that into context, um, and to put some numbers to it, um, we've had a um, significant amount of generation, more than we've kind of accommodated over 20 gigawatts of generation on the network that was designed for 14 gigawatts of maximum demand. So we've completely um, transformed um, the way in which the network operates in a, in a, in a network that's uh, designed for uh, central flows, um, central generation flowing down to uh, consumers, we have now see uh, networks where actually there's an abundance of generation down the distribution network. All of that generation capacity that is now connected to our network, um, a significant proportion of that is PV. Um, and that is again that the proportions there have been dom have um, been pushed by the different levels of incentives and the different eases and maturity of the different technology. But Again, we've got 10 gigawatts of capacity that's actually connected to the network over 9.5 gigawatts of capacity that we have offered out and has been accepted, um, and therefore we have um, the ability to accept off the network. And another 3.5 of generation capacity, again, that's offered, and therefore that if it was accepted, we'd have to um, allow connection to the network. So we've seen a huge amount of generation connected. Um, in terms of uh, showing how this looks, I, I, I particularly like this... Um, graph which just shows the kind of levels of generation and demand on our network and again it shows the kind of transformation from where from the original kind of design of the network so we start with the kind of little bars across the line with with the green bars that show the winter peaks for each of the distribution license areas and traditionally this is ha what the network is designed for uh, for um, fulfilling winter peak um, and, and that is what the networks were designed around and you got uh, of course, you'd see your summer peak being significantly lower. So obviously, with without all that addition of um, heating or heating loads on the network, you see much lower levels of demand in in summer. And then your minimum demand, peak demand would then be your minimum demand that you would see on your network. 
Um, and you compare that against the volume of distributor generation we've got connected, and you can see that in all of the license areas, the connected and accepted distributor generation exceeds the summer peak. Um, and in most of the license areas, um, then you will actually see the amount of uh, connected, accepted and connection generation exceeding the winter peak. So this would say that actually if everything that was connected exported at the same time, you would see higher, um, the net would be, would be accepting more generation than the, than the maximum demand is traditionally uh, designed for. Uh, the differences you see around uh, the West Midlands uh, just accommodates some of the different uh, geography there and generally accommodates for things like Birmingham. Um, again, kind of looking into more detail with what, what this then does to the network, um, as we have, um, we, as you connect more and more um, PV to the network, um, this has um, some really kind of interesting effects on the network. So first, obviously you have um, a high output that is focused on the middle of the day and in the middle of the summer. So the profile below shows you the, the typical output of a PV generator with blue being low output and red being high output. And as you can see, as you shift through the year, um, you get higher outputs in the, middle of the, in the middle of the year. And as you shift through the day, you get higher outputs in the middle of the day. So the middle of the summer, middle of the day, you get quite high outputs for PV. That combines with a time when we have typically have quite low load on the network. Um, and it's also a time when we have um, generally have lower network ratings. So overhead lines are rated on their ability to dissipate heat. As you have higher ambient temperatures in the summer, um, then their ability to dissipate heat is reduced, and therefore the low, the ratings that you can push through them um, is reduced. Now traditionally this was quite this was wasn't too much of an issue because again our highest flows through the network were in winter, so this wasn't a huge concern. But again, as we're now trying to export a lot of, a lot of energy uh, in the middle of the day in the summer, this is uh, something that um, restricts flows. So all this together kind of create, and with the amount of generation that is connected, um, is creating quite a few constraints on our network, um, and therefore we are looking for, the mo um, for cost effective manners to continue to allow us to connect um, generation and to continue to move things forward. So what is Project Sync? So Project Sync, uh, Sync stands for Solar Yield Network Constraints and it's very much focused around this challenge of how we deal um, with um, PV generation, how we can mitigate the, the, some of the constraints that come around that and how we can continue to grow um, this uh, very interesting industry. Um, and the aim is very much around how we can do that through demand side response, so how we look at using customer behaviours to shift um, to shift uh, uh, the impact of PV and to mitigate some of that impact. And again, there are there are various different constraints that come out off the back of uh, PV, and therefore we've looked at different different ways of considering them. So, as I said, we've got four different sort of challenges that we came out of um, out of P out of uh, sync, and this was split into them. This kind of naturally split the um, trial into four techniques. Uh, the first was looking around uh, some of the rapid voltage changes that you get, or some of the rapid current changes that you get um, around uh, cloud cover over um, PV sites. So again, because uh, the output of the PV site is directly coupled to the solar irradiance, if you, if you see a quick drop of irradiance with cloud passing over, um, then actually you can see quite rapid changes on the network. And so we wanted to understand what the impacts of, of that were and whether you could use uh, deliver some sort of solution to that. We also looked at how to establish a sort of local uh, market around demand, so understanding that uh, demand has value to local customers, particularly in constrained areas with active network management schemes, and trying to investigate the options around there. Technique 3 looked at how we as a distribution network operator can best um, use demand side response to manage uh, uh, constraints on our network. Um, how to use uh, sort of demand turn up services to help us um, reduce constraints in the middle of the day. And then technique four looked at the underlying charging mechanisms uh, that are um, that are used on on the network and start trying to understand whether uh, instead of using direct signals for signals for the technics one two and three whether the underlying um, uh, charging signals um, could help. Um, influence what was going on on network. 
So if we look at technique one first, so this is very much looking at the impacts of um, of cloud cover on PV dominated networks. Uh, this piece of work was carried out by Crest at Loughborough University and was split into two sections. Uh, the first section was to do a literature review, so was to so was to have a look at kind of the academic literature around and try and understand um, what uh, what thoughts there were around um, around the potential effects of rapid changes of um, of, the, of the effects of cloud cover. Um, this was to try and kind of build up on uh, build some kind of real evidence around some of the anecdotal. Um, and stories we've been hearing about the network and trying to see whether actually there's something behind it. Alongside that we also um, carried out an investigation of some of the existing data we already had on the network. Um, so one of, one of the follow-ups this would have been uh, to install monitoring and to look into more detail but we thought to start with let's um, uh, analyse some of the existing data sets we already had um, and to try and understand whether we actually see any strange things happening on the network, whether we see excessive tapping on tra tra transformers, where we see strange voltages, and to understand that um, in more detail. So what we actually ended up doing was taking, uh, and that, da that data was based around um, some of the logs that we had at our tap changes. What did we find from this? Um, what we found uh, when the literature review was actually there were quite a few papers that were looking into the area um, and there's all sorts of very interesting bits of information things like um, the increase in uh, PV output you see just as a cloud is coming over due to kind of the um, reflecting effects of clouds uh, we saw all sorts of other very interesting bits but the general kind of view was that um, whilst there were quite a few papers that predicted um, certain issues um, with 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 the cloud cover, generally most of those didn't really consider the um, the size of PV arrays and therefore treated them all at, uh, treat, used single points of data for whole arrays. I think that's kind of quite well shown by the graph uh, by the top graph we have there, and just showing the averaging effect of what happens if you use multiple sensors rather than one and what happens when you aggregate over time. So when you look at the output, the irradiance on one sensor, you see quite peaky loads, quite spiky loads. However, if you look at a group of sensors across that, that very much averages out. And when you're looking at group of sensors, uh, when, when we're looking at this group, it was very much sensors spaced out over a typical um, PV, uh, large PV site, and that kind of shows the kind of uh, graduating effect that um, just the size of some of these sites has. And so that kind of showed us that there, whilst there's potential for impacts, actually some of the some of the uh, concerns are mitigated by the sort of natural sizing and dis and geographic dispersion of things of these um, PV sites connected to the network. We then looked at the data set and um, again um, had some quite interesting results. So one thing that was very noticeable was, it was that you, very, you did really see quite large uh, and very, quite rapid changes of um, current on the network. So you saw things changing on some networks, flowing, flows changing by up to 15 megawatts in a couple of minutes. However, this didn't really translate to any excessive um, any difference or any any noticeable differences in voltages or even the number of taps tappings that um, transformers were um, were doing, um, and this kind of is, is taken from the fact that you know whilst current is solely uh, determined by what is on that feeder, obviously voltage is um, is a state that is attributed to the wider network plus some influence of the local feeder. Um, and I think one graph that kind of shows this kind of lack of noticeable effect was uh, is this number is this graph of number of taps changes happening in different locations, and you can still see that the the much larger number of tap changes is happening uh, over the winter rather than the summer period, and we're not seeing strange spikes in the summer. Um, it was um, we spent quite a lot of time comparing different sites that had quite large amounts of PV connected and other sites with, with very little. And whilst you could see quite discernible differences in the current traces, uh, once it came to the voltages, there's very little to be seen of difference. In terms of technique two, um, this was looking at how we could um, how we could try and deliver value to customers from demand from changes in demand. So, um, 
whilst technique three, which I'll come on to, looks at how we can use um, increases in demand or reductions in generation to help um, the network operator, uh, technique two was very much focused about how we could deliver benefits to customers. And the natural um, place to look at this was through some of our active network management schemes. Um, in active network management schemes, uh, customers connect to the network um, and instead of uh, paying for reinforcement, accept curtailment on their output when the network is reaching its limits. As such, if you could add additional load into that system, um, as a generator would have been curtailed, well actually that curtailment would be reduced and there would be a direct value to that customer. Um, and so Technique 2 was about trying to investigate this in a, in a bit more detail and see whether a market around there would be possible. Now originally we were, we were looking at trialling this, but actually the low levels of curtailment seen by our a and connected customers meant that that would have been very tricky. Um, and so uh, we focused our attention on looking at sort of market designs and trying to understand some of the complexities that come off this. We also stayed away from some of the technical implementation because that was that um, float, um, coincided with some of the work that uh, Scottish Power had done on their art project and so we were keen not to duplicate work. Um, so to explain what we are kind of what, how how this, a load matching scheme might work, um, these graphs that I have, um, oh, these tables on the have I have on the right, uh, just a kind of visual demonstration of firstly how an AM scheme might work in a very crude, um, basic view, and then how um, a load matching scheme might work. So if you start on the top table, uh, you have um, time going from left to right. Um, and with it over that time, you have three different generators in a LIFO stack. So LIFO is last in, first out, um, and this means that generators at the top of the stack will stay on the network, uh, so have, have priority on the network over generators at the bottom. Now, all of these generators can be curtailed um, if there is a limitation on the network. However, it will be generators lower down on the stack that are curtailed ahead of um, ones higher up. And at the bottom, you see the number just kind of depicting the level of demand on that network. And so figure one is just the base, a base kind of system where you see um, demand reducing on the network and therefore uh, generation being curtailed accordingly. And it starts with generators two and three being curtailed in, in time step two, in time step three, they're all curtailed. In time step four, you see that um, generator one coming back on. In time step five, they're all back on. Now, um, one of the thought, one of the interesting points was that actually increases in demand um, can have values to customers directly without um, a distribution network operator uh, being involved in these systems, and actually could be put put in place through a bilateral with customers. However, in this process, the timing of when um, demand should be increased is, is quite. Um, important because the benefit falls to the marginal generator. So the generator that is next in the queue for being released back onto the network is what it sees the value of this if, of this um, increase in demand and therefore the timing of that is quite difficult and it only works if you are the marginal generator. If you are further down in the stack then actually you'd have to pay, you'd have to raise sufficient demand to lower um, to uh, release generate all the generators ahead of you and then yourself. The view was that if you had a, the DNO involved within this system, then actually we could attribute the increase in demand to the customer that paid for it. And so in figure three, you see um, a scenario where um, generator two has paid for an increase in demand in time, time period three, so it's gone up by one, and therefore that generator can be released. And unlike in figure two, where that um, increase in demand uh, release generator one, in this case it releases generator two. And this works um, quite nicely and uh, quite simply where you're just looking at increases in demand. However, generally, uh, when we look at demand side response, it's not just about increasing the demand, but shifting demand. And this is where some of the complexity around the markets get started coming into place. Um, so in figure four, you see a shift of demand. So if you go back to figure one, which is your base case, effectively here, you've taken a unit of demand from time step one and put it into time step three. And in this case, things work out well again, and your system would allow, um, would account for that going to time step uh, to generator two. However, this is where some of the complexity comes into the system, um, is where, is, as, you, as, as when you have demand shifting, 
not only does it matter where the demand goes, uh, where the demand appears, but it also matters um, when it's where it's gone from. And figure five kind of highlights that. If you take the demand from a, t a time when other generators are curtailed, then suddenly other generators could see increases in their level of curtailment because of your shift in demand. And that's shown in figure five, where effectively that reduction in time period uh, two um, causes generator one to be curtailed when it wouldn't have been. And this shows some of the complexities that, that come with with trying to implement a market like this. This is a very simplistic view of how of, of, of how an AM system works, looking at very discrete time scale, quite large time scale steps and three generators. In reality, AM schemes are continuously updating on a on a sort of minute by minute basis. And the levels of demand and generation are continuously fluctuating, and as such, there are some really complex um, market uh, really complex things to try and accommodate into a market. Um, the first is around kind of baselining. So as you as as you've shown, you what you need to do if you're going to look at changes in demand is trying to attribute, is trying to determine a baseline, and this is really challenging when trying uh, when looking at curtailment especially on the time scale at which an a and system will work, operate. If you're looking at minute by minute forecasting of uh, outputs of demand and generation on, on, a, very, on a relatively um, cons uh, limited network, it becomes incredibly difficult. Now you could um, expand the time horizon in which you are looking for um, looking to baseline and look at doing things into half hourly segments where you will inherently have flatter profiles but to do this you will end up having to uh, simplify um, things quite significantly and this would uh, make it much harder um, to retain the value of the services. I think the other big thing that, that as I described earlier is the potential for detriment to other customers and this is particularly of concern in um, systems that are already in place. Um, when actually uh, the implementation of a load matching scheme would actually uh, change almost the principles of access. You would no longer be doing operating purely on a LIFO basis, but you would also be operating on a commercial basis. And as such, um, almost your commercial awareness would take priority over your LIFO stack position, and customers could see their curtailments affected quite drastically by the actions of others. And, and this kind of led to our general conclusion around this, that actually this would be an incredibly complex scheme to deliver, um, especially in existing, in existing A&M networks, as you would almost have to rewrite the rules of access. So that was a quick overview of Technique 2. Uh, in terms of Technique 3, this was uh, looking at what we could use for, how we could use demand to turn up to help the network. So, um, and this involved a... Um, WPD looking to develop a service to help us manage the networks over the summer. So looking at a view where um, effectively we, we, might, we may have to reinforce the network because of um, a sort of an increase in, in embedded generation on the network and looking to, to see if there's cost effective alternatives um, to doing so. And to do that, we look, we trialled uh, a service in the South and South Wales over 2016. And this builds on some of the learning from some of our other demand side response projects like Falcon. Now, the way the service was delivered was actually we um, uh, developed a collaborative service uh, alongside National Grid, um, and this kind of tied into their demand turn up service. Um, this was um, done to um, try and provide simplicity for customers, um, as both um, SO and DNO were looking for customers to provide similar responses in similar time frames in similar locations. It made a lot of sense to try and coordinate that um, to avoid um, any concerns over conflicts of services. And so in this service, um, it was it proved really interesting uh, uh, opportunity to try an interesting new market model. Um, WPD effectively uh, had a held a bilateral with National Grid um, and National Grid then co um, contracted with customers. Um, and in fact this is the first time a DNO has had a has ever had access to uh, customers um, who are part of the uh, sort of uh, ancillary services. So with this, with with within the solution, customers only had a single point of access, which was through National Grid, and then could be called by two parties, so by National Grid or by WPD, um, 
but they would never see um, which of those who, which part which um, party was calling them. Um, so in terms of the customer proposition, I thought it'd be worth just quickly going over what that looked like. So as I said, the customer contract with National Grid, uh, there were two service windows that were available. So one was an overnight window and one was the afternoon an afternoon window for weekends. Uh, WPD um, would, uh, would uh, was, uh, was interested in particular on that, in that weekend period, um, which is when we had um, in, in during the middle, during the afternoon, which is when we'd have particular constraints on our network. Um, but National Grid we were looking to um, utilise both of those windows. Um, within that, there was also uh, we offered a fairly rigid pricing structure. So as the service was launched, to try and give our people an idea of where the value should be. Um, there were three options for. Um, utilization and a fixed price for um, availability um, uh, also in terms of the service what uh, the way it works is effectively customers provided uh, availability to, to um, national grid by 12 on the Friday uh, by 12 o'clock on the Friday and that provided um, uh, their availability for the week ahead um, and if they and if there was a requirement for them to get called they would get have an email dispatched to them and um, if WPD wanted to call uh, the customer effectively, we um, emailed uh, National Grid, who in turn dispatched it for us. And so the customer was unaware of who that dispatch was coming from. Uh, in terms of findings that came off the back of this report, um, we had over 300 utilizations over the summer, um, of which only two were from uh, WPD. Most of National Grid's um, calls were in window one, um, whereas uh, WPD's requirements were generally in window two. Um, the, the limitation in the number of, of calls by WPD was generally around uh, relatively low available volumes in the target area. Um, so whilst we were focusing very much in the southwest and south Wales, uh, the majority of volume that was purchased through the National Grid Service was uh, in was in a wider area. Um, but of the of the of calls that were made, there was generally relatively high um, reliability and generally quite good customer relations. Uh, one of the things that really came off the back of it was um, the view that actually that with lots of these services, it takes time to grow and mature some of these services. Um, and so, to, in taking this forward, WP is very much maintaining a watching brief on demand to, to see whether we can see volumes increase in the target areas. Uh, the final technique that we looked at was uh, technique four, looking at um, sort of uh, charging adjustment payments. So whereas the uh, other techniques were looking at sort of direct signals that could be sent to customers, this was very much trying to understand how um, background signals um, and background charging methodologies can help influence customers. Um, the topic, with the 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 aim of the of the technique was very much to try and deliver a desktop study to um, stimulate some discussion in the area um, but one thing that became very quickly apparent was that actually quite a lot of um, discussion um, started to appear around this topic and this is especially through some of the, the some very new channels that have come along as the project's go, gone along so discussions through um, off uh, the ENA's open networks project or through off gems targeted charging review and so because of these kind of changes, uh, we decided to descope um, T4 uh, to try and prevent any duplication and to really try to focus the um, these very interesting discussions around charging uh, in one in one or two cor in this kind of existing industry for us so that we didn't end up um, with uh, lots of people discussing similar things in different um, instances. So to quickly sum up um, the general findings from Project Sync. Um, in terms of uh, rapid changes caused by cloud cover, um, the general view was that um, there was limited concern and actually lots of the um, potential concerns are alleviated through um, just some of the inherent network stability and some of the um, some of the geographic spread of PV. Um, in terms of the load matching scheme, um, one of the big challenges around is the complexity of it, and therefore that might quite um, highly impact its effect, our ability to roll that out at scale, especially due to the um, potential detriment to existing customers. In terms of some of the demand turn up services that we saw um, in technique three, 
um, WPD is very much keeping a watching brief on how that service de um, develops with National Grid and to try and see how target volumes increase within areas of where um, there is need for us. Um, and in addition, WPD is going to continue to work on some of the uh, very interesting um, conversations that are happening at the moment around GWAS changes and other routes to market. For all this, there is a huge amount more detail uh, on our website um, in many, the many reports that were compiled as part of this. And so if you do have any more questions, then please do um, go and have a look at those. Another thing I just want to highlight is our DSO transition document, which is currently out for consultation. Uh, so this is very much highlighting, uh, investigating all the things that might need to happen or our plan for our transition to DSO and includes things around flexibility services and so it quite, lends quite nicely into some of the work that we were looking um, at in Project Sync. So that's all I had to say today. Um, thanks for listening and if you do have any questions then please do get in contact. Thanks.